Um, but yeah, so just as we dive in, um, so I have the privilege, obviously, this morning of sharing with everybody. And um, can I just say, it's always not, it's not an easy thing, because Barry takes us quite deep, and to try to continue from where he left off is quite difficult. So I've watched Barry's sermon about 400 times this last week. And then I'm thinking, how, how on earth am I going to continue? And I was like, thank goodness, firstly, there's a worship team. Because if you guys don't know, every time I've preached so far, it's been on the break. So this is really cool for me to have worship. But also just something that I think is so prevalent in the world today. So it actually wasn't, it was a difficult passage to prepare, but it wasn't difficult when we just see what's happening around us. And this is just this topic in today's sermon of watching out for fakes. Um, you would have known by now that Barry has mentioned that a lot, that, that they're fake teachers, they're, they're false prophets all around us. And I started doing some, some research and seeing that even Moses in Deuteronomy 13 and obviously in Jeremiah 5 both speak about watch out for fake prophets or fake teachers, fake leaders. And so it wasn't just something that had happened um, after Jesus had come and Jesus had gone. It, it had been for, since before Jesus even came, BC days, that there were fake teachers leading people down different paths. Um, Moses actually even said that they should be put to death. That's how serious Moses was about kind of wiping out the scourge of, of fakes and getting rid of them. And, and so it kind of got me thinking, why is it so important to, to know or to be on the lookout for fakes? Because wouldn't it be so much easier if somebody just walked into the church and said, Hello, I'm a fake teacher. I'm going to take you down this road. But they don't. They, they, they come in with the most eloquent of words. And, and we start, yes, sometimes we do tease them. Like I was just joking, bury myself with like talking about Apostle Pointy Shoes um, and that the pulpit's got to be open in the bottom so your shoes can fit underneath it. And it's very easy to make jokes about it. But it's, it's actually not a laughing matter when you start thinking about it. Yes, we can make fun of it, but the thing is, they come in and they secretly bring in false teachings and deception into the church. They're not going to come out and be upfront and saying, hey, I'm going to take you down this road where you shouldn't be going. Um, it's a slow fade. Um, there's a song, I'm trying to remember who sang it, and the line of the song is, it's a slow fade when black and white turn to gray. And that's what false teachers do, where all of a sudden it's a slow fade from going, this is the truth, to taking us down this path. And um, Paul warns um, young Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, that these fakes are not only going to be deceiving themselves, but they're going to be deceiving those around them. And that their teaching is so destructive that it destroys not only their faith, but the faith of those that get listened to it, the faith of those that get wrapped up in it, and the faith of those that get led astray by these people. For me, it's heartbreaking that when I meet some young guys at school and that kind of stuff, and they turn and they say, George, I don't go to church or to youth anymore. And you ask them why? And it's because somebody has said something, and I'm going, where on earth did they get that? And there's no longer, but the Bible says, it's like, oh, but my pastor said, duh, so we've got to do that. And going, well, where on earth did they even base that thought from? How did they even get from there to there? That, that some people get so caught up in listening to, to what their pastor says or what some guy on TV says that they don't open God's word. And, and for me, it's heartbreaking to see that some young people fall for that. that. And I'm sure when we get honest that it's not just young people that we all can fall for it. And we start seeing this letter, and hopefully when you start seeing what, what Peter's written here to Peter, that he's actually writing to, to young believers, to young Christians. And so we see in, in chapter 1, he, he's giving this guidance about growing in your faith. And, and he's saying things, remember, we, we spent a while looking at the characteristics that, that believers should have. And now all of a sudden he transitions to warning us actually what's out there. It's one of the things that I believe in youth ministry that we drop the ball so often that we get guys in matric in high school and they're ready to go in the world and they face varsity and everything 
comes crashing down. And so Peter's kind of doing that same thing here, where it's like, I've taken you on this journey of knowing what you should know, but now I'm going to teach you what you should be on the lookout for. And this morning, as we read our passage, let's keep that thought in mind, watching out for fakes. So if you're following along, and I really encourage you, don't you want to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2? And we're just reading the first 11 verses. Sorry, my, my hair's getting long and playing in my heart. Like real world issues here. Okay, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will clearly teach destructive heresies and deny even the master who brought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell. And God did not spare the ancient world, except for Noah and seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and day and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of judgment. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desires and those who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings. But the angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against the supernatural beings. Yo, quite a, quite a passage that Barry has left me with again. And you may be wondering, what, what is the, why do we have to look out for these fakes? And it kind of got me just, just thinking about something that I read years ago about the Secret Service. So now, I should have kept the, quest, the chocolate for this question, but I didn't. I apologize. Sorry. But who knows what the main role of the Secret Service is? Yes, Ben? To protecting the President of America. I would have to tell you, you are wrong. The main role of the Secret Service is actually investigating anything to do with money fraud in the States. Protecting the president was kind of something they did as a sideline. You kind of are right. Up until 2003, now it's become the second. So they do two things. Any money laundering in the States, the Secret Service investigates. Any counterfeiting, the Secret Service investigates. And they also look after political leaders. Up until 2003, they were actually part of the Department of Treasury, not part of the Department of Homeland Security. Now you may be wondering where I'm going with all this kind of stuff. And, and just start thinking about it. So the Secret Service agents, one of their main roles is to find counterfeit notes. And how they do that, we would assume that they would be given all of these fake notes, and they would be like, hey, here, these are the fake notes. When you spot one of these, you know it's fake. That's not how they're trained. They're given real notes, real U.S. currency. And, and, and they handle it, and they look at it, and they study it intensely. They know exactly what that real note looks like. So when they literally just pick up a fake note, they can spot it straight away. Even in the States, they still deal with checks. There, there, there's, there's things on checks, sort of security measures that have been developed. The Secret Service knows all of that stuff. So that literally when they see something that's out of place, literally just see it or just feel it, they know that it's a fake straight away. Now, now here's the question, is our faith like that? That we know our faith so well, that we know God so well, that when we just see a fake, we're able to say, that's a fake. When we just hear somebody saying something from the pulpit, or whether it's on TV, or whatever it's like, actually, hey, 
That's not biblical. Or do we simply rely on, on people like Barry and myself to, to teach us? Do we only open up our Bibles once a week on a Sunday? The, the scary thought, if you read from the Barn Institute, you know what good church attendance is in the United States? Once a month. Once a month is considered excellent church attendance in the States from people. If you only opening up Scripture once a month, how on earth are we going to be able to spot fakes? Because you actually don't know anything. Again, just going back to what Paul tells young Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, from verse 2 to 5. Teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Paul, Paul kind of urging and, and pushing Timothy on to teach these things. Teach these things that you know to be true and teach everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but our teachings are wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt, and they have their backs turned to the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. And see, so even Paul, who was a mentor to Timothy, saying, Timothy, you, you're leading a church now. You're doing this thing. You're a young man. Teach people the truth. And realize that you are going to get people coming and being divisive against you. Why? Because they're looking out for their own interests. Going back to our passage, and Peter gives three very easy ways to, to identify a false teacher. And you can find all three of them actually in verse 3 if you look really hard. And the first one is immorality. It's actually scary to see how many people in the pulpit fall to this. How many people in the pulpit um, get so caught up in immorality? We, we've seen pastors now recently within the last year firing church members because he went and he just said to a senior pastor, I'm struggling with lustful thoughts to find out the pastor was having an affair the whole time. We see that happening to this day. People pointing fingers at other people, but they're not looking at their own lives. We need to be asking ourselves, the, the people that we're listening to, these, these false teachers, if they are, what does their relationship with their wife look like? Is there a great deal of immorality just in their church? Because remember the saying, a fish rots from the head down? The same thing is true in the church. Greed. Money is the, the one thing. And please, I, I need to say this very, very respectfully. Okay? We need to pay our pastors and our missionaries because we also need to survive. And, and, and it's amazing how often people be like, oh, but live on faith. And it's like, yeah, that's great for you to say when you've got like four cars at home and you go out for supper every night and live on faith. Okay, please, I'm not trying to promote giving more money to the church or anything like that, but we do need to support our missionaries, we need to support our teachers, our pastors, 1 Corinthians 9, Galatians 6, 1 Timothy 5, they all speak about supporting those that teach you, supporting those that look after you in a spiritual sense. But before we just kind of give our money, there's a few things that we need to be asking. What is the prime motive of this organization or this teacher? What is the prime motive? What, what are they actually wanting? Before you send any money to the cause, hopefully you're doing some due diligence. I, I, I'm just going to use names here, for, and this is just examples. So we've got Francois on the front here who's a missionary. Okay? So now imagine he's like, guys, please support me, and he speaks really well, and we give him lots of money, only to find out that he's buying himself a new car, and he's doing this, and, and then when he gets challenged on it, he's like, yeah, but you know, my daughter needed a car because her first car she didn't really like, so we have to give her the second car. And, you know, going, well, what is the motive behind that? Like, yes, she needs a car to get around, 
but she doesn't exactly need like a Golanda Wagen at like a couple of million rand. A Toyota Taz, if you guys know what that is, is absolutely fine. So, so, so what is the motive of that? Because some people justify that. We've seen, have you noticed, I'm not using any names because I'm being very clear about who, who we say this about, but some people will try and justify having private jets and that kind of stuff. And, and going, I've got this private jet in the hangar, but it's too small to go here, or it's not fast enough to go there. If I can get there a little bit quicker, that's another half an hour of teaching that I can give. I'm going, what's the motive behind us having a bigger, fancier, newer jet? You know, so hopefully we're doing some due diligence in that. Asking ourselves, this person, this organization, are they serving God, or are they just promoting their own interests? Is, is our support going towards a lavish lifestyle, or is it actually going to ministry? I, I've, I've got no problem in supporting missionaries, because I know, hey, they need to go out. Hopefully, Francois and Doreen go out for, for supper every now and again. That the two of them can connect away from their daughters because their daughters are very special. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing at their daughters? That's not very nice. Especially young guys. Louise and Barry, missionaries as well. Hopefully, they're connecting on a, on a level away from their kids, just the two of them, to strengthen their marriage. Barry and Donay, myself and Helen. I don't have anything wrong with taking a missionary or a pastor taking their spouse out for dinner. If they're doing it every single night, maybe there's issues we need to speak about. But are they connecting? We need to be loving our missionaries in that as well. What are their motives for doing what they're doing? Lying. Have you ever noticed false teachers, when they get caught out in something, it's they, the words are just like blah, 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 and it's like, what actually did they say? When, when you challenge them on something, it's like, oh, but God told me. It's, like, it's almost like if God's the only one who speaks, or you're the only one that God speaks to. And there's some people that do that, and saying, God speaks to me and to me alone in this church. And it's like, that's not the God that I worship and serve. When, when they say things, and it's like, oh, yeah, but where do you find that scripturally? Oh, but the Bible does say, hey, yes, the Bible says, but where? You know, what are you basing your thoughts or your comments on? They get so offended and try and deflect away from the truth that, that they use, that when we ask them questions to, to um, question their motives, they start to fudge facts and, and they start blaming everybody else around them except themselves. You just start seeing some of the, the guys that have fallen recently, and they start blaming everybody from the devil to the lady that came to his room at 2 o'clock in the morning and skimpy outfit because she was called to, to all sorts of things not going, actually, hey, why are you just fudging the truth? You did this, there's evidence that you did it. You see, false teachers are never interested in helping anybody else except themselves. And they get, and what they can get out of the situation, how they can look best, they want to elevate themselves above everybody else, almost inflating their own ego. Peter's clear as to what the outcome of this will be, but actually don't worry about it, their punishment has already been decided. Their punishment has already been decided that they are going to be sorted out. Um, we just look at Mark 9, what Mark says in Mark chapter 9. That God's punishment is severe for those that lead others astray. God's punishment is severe for those that lead others astray. And so you may be sitting here kind of thinking, Yo, and sorry, I didn't mean for this to get so deep and gloomy so early on. But, but this is just the first three verses of this. And I started thinking about this. Isn't this the world that we live in? Just, just, just start thinking for a moment. Just look at the world that we're living in and just start thinking about the lifestyle of, of some of these famous pastors and preachers and stuff like that. We start seeing fakes all around us. And please, I'm not trying to say let's be supernatural because if we want to get super spiritual, we will find the devil in everything. If I looked hard enough, I could find the devil on the chair sitting in the front chair. And, and so I'm not saying that we've got to get that super spiritual. We just need to be on God. That's what, that's what Peter's telling us here. Be on God. Guard yourself. Look out for yourself. An extension by looking out for yourself, we look out for those around us. 
We look out for those around us. Why? Because we love each other. We, we start seeing the punishment that God has. And so we, we move on to, to the next couple of verses and just start thinking. Let's look at the first one quickly, angels. Now, when I was little, and I can't remember what, what supermarket chain this was, but when your mom bought enough stuff, you got one of those little angels. And you would put it in the fridge, and the nappy would either go blue or it would go pink, determining if it was a boy or a girl angel. And you looked at the thing, and it was like this cute little chubby thing, and it had these little gold little white wings and this little gold halo, and it was so cute, and they all had these little different poses. And sometimes that's what we think of angels, that these, they're these little things. And sort of movies have portrayed like Cupid to be like this little fluffy baby, well, fluffy, this little baby, this little cute little chubby baby with this golden arrow and stuff like that. And, and we start thinking, oh, but they're so cute. How could God possibly punish something that looks that cute? If you want to know what angels look like, just go read some of the Old Testament. In Ezekiel, it speaks about them having the head of a lion and a couple of other things like a, a, I've forgotten about a horse and an eagle. Um, it's three heads and one. It's quite confusing. Isaiah speaks about them having six wings, two to cover their face, two to cover their feet, and two to fly around with. So whatever angels looked like, that's not what I'm trying to go here. But angels were created to worship and to serve God. It was like, you will worship and you will serve God. Angels didn't have a choice. Because why would happen? We know, looking back at, the, at Satan, Satan wanted to be like God or be God, and he got wiped out of heaven, okay? With a couple of other angels as well. So God punishes angels. God punishes the things that were created to worship and serve him. Jude 1 verse 6 says, And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. If God can take an angel, something that he created, to be in relationship, to be in service, to be in worship of him, and saying, You've messed up. You've overstepped your lines. I'm locking you up until the great day of judgment. Imagine what God will start doing to false teachers. He continues and, and he just starts describing the flood. And we're speaking about Noah in Genesis from Genesis 6 to 8. And just, I want to read this really quick about Noah. It's from Genesis 6. From verse 5. And the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought he imagined was consistently and totally evil. God examined the earth and just saw that these oaks are just dodgy. That these oaks, everything they think about is just pure filth and disgusting. So the Lord was sorry that he ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. Imagine God being sorry that he actually ever made mankind. Because that's what it's saying here. That God was sorry that he even made them, that he even put them on the earth. And, and my mind starts going places like, does that mean that God wants to wipe out just man and leave the earth? Or, or has man corrupted things so much? We continue. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I've created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing. All the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, even the birds of the sky. God, the way I kind of think about it, it's almost like, so if you've ever got a problem with your computer, okay, and one day you're going to phone somebody like Tim, and Tim's first words to you are going to be, have you turned it on and off? Uh, have you ever noticed whenever you phone somebody, this is like, my computer's not working. Have you reset it? This kind of feels that God's like almost wanting to push reset on creation. That, that it's got to the point where he's like, I'm actually just so over this, it's broken. It's not working how it should. I just want to push reset. I don't know if, thank goodness I don't have the power because I think I would push reset a couple of times. But Noah found favor with the Lord. But Noah found favor 
with the Lord. And, and is start thinking about that Noah and his family, the only people in all of creation that found favor with God. That, that's, that's scary. God saying that I'm actually so sad that I ever breathed life, my breath, into humankind. I just want to wipe them off the face of the earth. But Noah found favor. Just think about what's happening here for a moment in Genesis 6. The world is so full of fakes and false people and false teachers that, that they've spread not just from one little, not one community or one little town. The whole world has been corrupted by false teaching, except for one family. We see Sodom and Gomorrah as well. He had just two towns that had become so corrupted and so perverse that God used fire. And when I say fire, I'm kind of presuming fire because he says he turned it into ash. Kind of you get ash after fire. You know, it's kind of me, one and one is two. But God used fire to wipe it out. But not until he rescued Lot. When, when we just start seeing these, these three Old Testament examples, I don't know about you, but I just see the power and the might of God. I just see the, the holiness, the glory, the magnificence of God. That, that His world and His, His way is so perfect that actually when we mess up, we just don't get it. And even before that, we've already been born sinful that we just don't get it. But it starts showing you something like grace as well. And I don't know about you, but I, I can sometimes become very self-righteous and start going, look at everybody else around me. God, I'm fine. And normally that's kind of when I need to realize, actually, hey, Jordan, you've got an issue. You're kind of leading people astray here. We, we get to the point of going, but look at that church, or look at them, they're doing this. God, I'm fine. Why are you allowing all of this to happen? Why aren't you blessing me? Why aren't you saving me? Hopefully we start realizing the importance of looking out for fakes. Because it's so easy to go down that road. Whether we want to accept it or not, it is so easy to go down that road. It's so easy to try and make ourselves look important. Instead of just saying, hey, this is what I think. Or, I'm really not sure, that's a really good question. Let me do a bit of research and come back to you. Let, let, let's be vulnerable with one another. Because when we start doing that, we start seeing what was happening. Lot, who was, was totally sick, and so it says in our scripture that he was sick and tired of all the disgusting actions around him. It's, it's almost like he had sleepless nights over what was happening. Guess what? Lot was a sinner. But Lot knew that he was a sinner. Just as God rescued Lot, who was a sinner, God is able to rescue us from temptations and trials. The, one of the things that I find absolutely amazing, and so we were actually just chatting in the office about it this last week, and we're having a bit of a giggle about this, about being in ministry and, and some of the things that you come across, and I'm sure those that have been involved in ministry or in the church for a while can probably testify to some of this thing. But some of the excuses that people come up with, Oh, the devil made me do it. Yeah, so the devil made you um, open up your dad's liquor cabinet, get really drunk, and then have an accident in a car. That was all the devil. Don't worry, you find it was the devil. Um, just, um, the, the, she's really, really pretty, and I didn't mean to do that. The devil made me do that. Is, yeah, the devil made you keep looking all the time and not look away. And, and so we were just talking and joking about that. It's amazing the trap that we fall into where we start blaming everybody else except ourselves for what's going on. And, and, and what we were kind of coming up with is that it's so easy in our own lives when we just actually lose focus. When, when we kind of just shift our focus away from God and shift it on to, to the world. Because let's be really honest, the world is a very attractive place. Anybody that says that the world is not attractive... 
um, sure, you, you're a much better person than I ever will be. We, when we bought our house um, in the middle of COVID, okay, and, and you know church attendance, we weren't allowed to come to church and stuff like that, and going, I've got no idea where our money is going to come from to pay the bond. And all of a sudden, you start having all these weird and wonderful thoughts about where you could borrow money from until you had the money to pay it back. And then realizing, hey, got to listen to the Christian he's saying and just have faith in God. It's so easy that the world is so attractive that we want to do all this stuff and do all these things. Um, in ministry, one, one of the things, and, and I chat to quite a few young youth pastors, and one of the first questions they asked me, so how big is your youth group? I was like, I don't know. And they're like, don't you count numbers? I was like, no. Sometimes we've got so many guys, sometimes we've only got a few guys, things happen. I'm not worried about the numbers of guys that come. I'm more worried about their spiritual lives. And they're like, but what do you mean? It's like, we can have the biggest group in the world, but actually, hey, if they're all this shallow, it means nothing at the end of the day. The same thing, you get together at a fraternal with pastors, and one of the first questions they ask is, so, so how's your church going? What they're actually asking is, how many people come to your church? Or, or how, how's the offering going for you? We found it really, really difficult after COVID. They're just asking how much money you got in the bank to try and kind of elevate themselves. The world is very, very attractive. And what I'm getting at is it's very, very easy to fall into that trap of becoming a fake ourselves. That is why we need to know the truth, watch for the truth, so that when we look at our own lives, we can see what's happening. I've just gone blank on the reference, um, but it speaks about how, how Scripture and the law is not there to, to judge us. It's actually a mirror to show us how evil we are. Anybody can remember, please help me remember where it is. I know it's the New Testament. I've gone blank. If you want to Google, I, th I think it is. Yes, could be. So that, maybe that's homework. You can get a chocolate next week if you know where that's from. But Josh, it says scripture's, not, scripture's there to, to actually show us how evil we are and how we've fallen and to get us back onto the right track. Okay, I know I paraphrased there quite a bit. Um, but we need to be looking at our own lives. We need to be kind of going, what's happening with me? That we need to realize that it's not us are the ones that have to go and start judging the whole world. And so this may sound a bit of a contradiction, but we should be judging those around us, not in a condemning way, but in a loving way. So be, imagine Joanne starting to do stuff. Please, I'm just picking on Joanne now. She knows that. And we go to her, and it's not like, Oh, Joanne, life's so tough. We know it's right. It's Joe, you've messed the mark. You, you, you've messed up. How are we going to help you get to where you need to be? You shouldn't be doing that, Joe. How are we going to help you get to where you need to be? That's judging somebody, but judging them in a way that brings them back to Christ. We kind of want to judge people in a way that elevates us to make us look better. And so we need to be very careful with false teachers. That when we have that, and so false teachers don't, don't only have to be from the pulpit. That can be anybody we come into contact with, any fake. We're never there to judge them, to bring them down. Our judging should be to build people up. Kind of positive or constructive criticism is the word I'm looking for. That's what we should be doing. And you may be wondering why I'm saying this. We need to listen to, to something. And Paul said it best in Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Living in the world today, I'm going to kind of give you a bit of a, a, like a news update, is difficult. I'm sure if you started asking some of the, the silver-haired people, like Pierre in the back there with all of his wisdom highlights, um, the longer and longer that he's been a Christian, he started realizing that more and more he actually doesn't have in common with people in the world. Start, start looking at people that are in business. And you can ask them, the longer and longer they've been in business, the longer and longer they've been Christian, start realizing that the world does business in a certain way, and as believers, we should be doing business God's way. We need to be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. It is going to be difficult. There's going to be times where it's be like, why don't we just do what everybody else in the world is doing, because it's just easier to get ahead. All that does is make us a fake. 
continuing from verse 11 in Ephesians 6. Put on God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil, evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly realms. So often we forget that actually there's this whole spiritual realm around us that's going on. And I'm going to say something that may sound very controversial, but as Westerners, we've actually got no idea what the spiritual realm is really like. Start chatting to, to guys, especially from an African context and that kind of stuff. We, we hear things like witch doctors and some gormas and that kind of stuff. And we kind of, as Westerners, are so quick to push that away. Start speaking to guys that live and that's part of their culture. Those guys can do some stuff. Satan is at work in the spiritual realm. We need to be aware of that. We need to be aware that Satan is at work all the time. Even though Satan knows that he's already been defeated, he's trying to take as many people down with him. We need to realize that the things that we fight are not principles and powers of this of world, of human things that we can see, but of a spiritual nature. That's why we need to be prepared. That's why we need to be watching out for fakes. Because when we get caught up with fakes, it's not just a temporary, oh yeah, that person was a good person or a bad person. Let me move on to the next person. It's your eternity that you're playing with. It's your eternity that you're playing with. False teachers will slander the spiritual realm. I, I, I've even heard some people from the pulpit say, you know there's no such thing as heaven on earth. I mean, you're a pastor in an evangelical church. How on earth could you say there's no such thing as heaven on earth? That's what some people say. And they get a whole church of people believing that. I mean, there's no such thing as a heaven and a hell. And they get a whole church believing that and going, so what happens kind of one day when we die? And you tell them, oh no, we could just get reincarnated into something else. I'm going, that's not Christianity at all. That's another world religion. You know? There, there, there's, some, there's some guys that say some really disturbing things from the front. False teachers will slander the spiritual reality that actually, hey, life here on earth is temporary. The spiritual realm is eternal. Spending time with God in heaven is eternal. They take Satan's power lightly, claiming that they have the ability to judge. So don't worry, you're fine, you're not doing anything bad, I've judged you, you're all right. That's what some false teachers do. Think about it. A false teacher, a fake, is in for the shock of their lives when they stand one day face to face with Jesus. And, and to, to go back to, to that EE3 question that maybe some of you know. And so EE3 was this thing called Evangelism Explosion. It was a way that back when Barry was a young guy, so that's a lot much before, longer than I was, what I'm trying to say, is that they taught you how to, to share the gospel and to share your faith. And, and one of the questions was that if you were standing in front of God in heaven one day, he asked the question, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And so imagine for a false teacher standing in front of God one day, and God says, why should I let you into my heaven? And they'll be like, but, but I did this, and I did this, and I had the biggest church in the world. Um, Jesus is going to be like, I actually just never knew you. I never knew you. Imagine standing there one day, and Jesus saying, I never knew you. Imagine as a teacher, somebody that you had the responsibility to, to share the gospel and to spread the word that you get to heaven one day and you've maybe sorted your life out and all that kind of stuff and you see your best friend standing on the other side of the gate, whether it's a spouse or something like that and okay, I'm using old ways of saying this, St. Peter says, sorry, you're going down, not up. And they say, but Jordan never told me. I did everything Jordan did. I did everything Jordan said to do from the pulpit or at youth. But Jordan never told me about this. You see how we need to watch out for fakes? Because we're not messing with something that's temporary. We're starting to play with something that's eternal. We're starting to play with something that's eternal. So, so what I'm not trying to say is that we must not become complacent about Satan being defeated. 
Many people become very complacent about Satan being defeated and that Christ has won the victory. That's called fire insurance. But you kind of just have this faith where you keep doing what you want to do because you've got fire insurance, meaning you're not going to go to hell. But it's so much more about that. Although Satan has been destroyed completely, he's still at work today. We need to stand God. We need to stand God not just for ourselves, but for those around us. We need to watch out for fakes. And the only way we can watch out for fakes is when we know the truth ourselves. When we are so, so in depth with the truth, when, when we are so in tune with God that we can spot it straight away. It's almost like we need to become the secret service agents of the gospel. Not keeping it a secret, but knowing it so well and, and striving to know it. Because one of the things that I didn't mention about the secret service agents is that they don't just get trained once on what real notes look like. They get trained continually and continually and continually. The same thing needs to be true about our faith. That we're training continually, continually, continually. Our faith is a muscle. And believe it or not, muscles can wither away. If you've ever had a leg or an arm or something on a cast, and you've broken a leg, and you know what it's like when you take that cast off after six weeks, you go from this one decent-sized calf muscle to this other scrawly little chicken bone-looking thing on the other side of the foot. Our faith can wither away if we don't water it, if we don't exercise it, if we don't continue striving to know more and more about Christ. Are we going to be secret service agents and know what the truth says that we can spot fakes? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to praise and thank you for this time. God, Lord, yes, we know that there was a lot to, to kind of take in. But Lord, we thank you that how when we look at it, Lord, you, you defend those who are righteous. Lord, we just think about Noah and that example. Lord, we know that Noah wasn't a perfect person. Lord, we know that Noah, after he had seen everything, got drunk, Lord, but you still loved him. Lord, we, we, we'll have a look at Lot, and yes, Lot was a sinful man, but you still loved him because he sought after you. He sought you with everything. And Lord, may we be like that as well. Lord, may we not get caught up in what the fakes of the world are trying to teach us. But may we get so caught up in you and knowing more about you that we strive for that, that we're able to spot those fakes from a mile away. So Lord, we pray that as we go into this week, Lord, Lord give us nude eyes, to, not only to, to see your truth in your word, but to see what is happening in the world around us. Lord, may, may we have a look at ourselves and, and start asking those questions, those hard questions, have I been a fake? Have I led someone astray? And, and seek just to, to correct that in a loving way. God, as well, we just want to pray for, for your love this week, Lord. Lord, when we start thinking about it, Lord, we know that there are so many in our congregation that are struggling. Lord, there are so many that have gone through heartache and pain. Lord, there are, there are those that are sick at the moment as well, or loved ones are sick. Lord, we just pray for a continued outpouring of your Spirit. We pray that we would just meet with you every single day. And Lord, we know that that is your desire as well, to have that deep personal relationship with us. That, that just like Lot, you are going to rescue us. All we have to do is stand firm in you. Just like Noah, you are going to rescue us. All we have to do is just stand firm in you. Lord, we just look throughout the whole of Scripture and there are so many examples of godly men and women standing firm in their faith, despite the world kind of crumbling around them. And Lord, we pray, may we be like that. That may our legacy one day when, when we're gone and people speak about us, may they say things like, yo, did you know that person? They, they lived this amazing life, sold out for God. Everything they did, they spoke the truth, they taught the truth, they lived the truth because God is central in their lives. Lord, as a church, as we strive to be gospel-centered, Christ-focused, mission-determined, may as a church, may we look at ourselves collectively as well. Never, ever, ever 
to become like the world, but to be separate from the world because we're living, speaking, breathing your truth. We pray now in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, please don't rush off. There is tea and coffee um, available. The, the coffee shop is running. Um, the reason we said there are cool things to drink as well, we do still have Coke and all that in the fridge. Um, so if you just chat to the guys that are at the coffee bar, they'll be able to tell you what we have. We don't only serve coffee. So please stay around for a cup of coffee, some fellowship, and we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.